What happens to that money you and I are making every single day? Uh, part of which, of course, we all know goes to Uncle Sam in the form of the income tax. It goes to Uncle Sam because we have a law in the books that says, as we all know, we're law-abiding people, that we have to file our returns and pay our taxes. You know, don't you, that that law wasn't always there. When this country was first founded, the Constitution was written in such a way that there were serious questions about whether the federal government could in fact impose an income tax. It did so during the Civil War, but after the Civil War, when in peacetime uh, an effort was made to impose a tax, the Supreme Court in the Pollock decision in 1894 struck it down. Uh, and said, in point of fact, that because of the clause in the Constitution that distinguished between direct and indirect taxation, and said that direct taxation had to be apportioned according to the population of the states, a direct income tax was, in fact, unconstitutional if it was levied on the income that people derived from their property, from their land, and so forth and so on. They struck it down. As a result of that, we got something that some of us are familiar with, of course. We got the 16th Amendment, purportedly establishing the right of the federal government uh, to levy this tax in spite of that wording of the original Constitution. Well, here's the rub. There are some folks in this country who believe that the 16th Amendment was never properly ratified. That in point of fact, the proper constitutional procedures and state procedures in many states were not observed. There are some other folks who believe that the mere fact that I raised that question proves that I'm some kind of nut. How could you even think about this? A major issue like this? Do you honestly believe, Alan, that that could have slipped through the cracks, that anybody would have failed to notice that something as important as an amendment to the Constitution hadn't been properly ratified? Big things like that don't slip through the cracks. Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, the state of Ohio was supposedly admitted to the Union in the 19th century. Uh, many decades later, somebody raised a question about whether or not the Congress of the United States had, in fact, passed the necessary resolution approving the admission of Ohio to the Union. And they discovered that, in fact, they had not. Can you believe this? Well, they tried to laugh it off for a while and so forth and so on, and then, as it turned out, they couldn't laugh it off anymore. And in 1953, on August 7th, by the way, my birthday, uh, Eisenhower signed into law a uh, bill that retroactively admitted Ohio to the Union. So you see, big things do fall through the cracks. They especially might fall through the cracks when you remember that the income tax was passed during an era when American politics wasn't exactly characterized by sweetness and light. It, it was one in which there was a vast amount of corruption and bosses and city machines and other elements of politics that were manipulated in the urban areas in the South and around the country. My, my first uh, kind of initiative uh, is one that I'm putting at the top of my economic agenda on behalf of the people of the whole country, and that is to abolish the wage slave tax system that in fact has coerced us into a position where more and more the resources we would devote to our works of faith are taken over by a government and used for faithless things that do not reflect our values. We must abolish the income tax and replace it with a system commensurate with the real freedom of the people. I believe, and I've often said to people, that uh, if the churches were doing their job, uh, there should be no such thing as a government welfare system. All right. and, and I think that people would be, be, be inclined to do the job that the Lord means for us to do if we were not burdened by a tax system that takes our money out of our hands before we get a chance to decide what to do with it. But think about this from a Christian point of view. What, in fact, is a true work of charity? As I see it, a true work of charity is actually, as Christ portrays it, it's an overflow of that abundant grace that God has shared with us on account of our faith. Is it not? And, and, and that is a free-flowing thing. It's not coerced. It's a simple and true consequence of the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. 
And, and, and if that overflowing is properly taking place, then nobody needs to beat us over the head, put a gun to our head, whip us out there so that we'll be doing the things for the poor and others uh, that Christ has enjoined upon us. No, this is a step we take because we're, we're thinking with his mind, which is in us, because we're feeling with, with his heart, which is in us, right? Now, now, when they set up a government system, coerce money out of our pockets through taxation, and then say that they're going to spend it on good works, do you know what they have deprived us of? They have deprived us of the opportunity to display true charity. And believe me, y'all, I think that's important. Why? Because the works of charity did not have as their objective to feed and to clothe in a physical sense. They have as their objective to give glory unto God so that we can achieve the conversion of hearts to Jesus Christ. And I, I have to tell you, I am afraid that when we move this into a government sphere, we are in danger of letting the glory go to the government that should really belong to God.